get an idea of what you were hoping to bring to the current COP19 discussions? Perhaps you could enlighten us. Well, at the World Energy Council, which is uh, a network of three to 4,000 uh, members, uh, we are very interested in uh, promoting an open and unbiased debate on issues around energy. Uh, we have a constituency which includes governments as well as business, as well as NGOs. And we think that uh, a main task for making progress in the energy and climate debate is to bring as much uh, uh, information to the table as it's possible in terms of having an informed debate which helps decision makers to, to put the right policies in place uh, going forward. Fantastic. And so how do you feel things have been progressing over the last week? And obviously, you know, we still have a week, well, the yeah. best part of a week to go. How, how's, how's the take up been? I think uh, what uh, was uh, very was very, uh, was very impressive for me was uh, the mood of the people I could feel over the last uh, couple, uh, couple of days. And in terms of um, actually, you know, having not an, an, having a very realistic and intense debate about some of the issues which, uh, which we're being faced with. And I think in some of the previous meetings of this kind, there have been all sorts of uh, very emotional debates uh, with uh, blame being attributed to different parties. Whilst on here in, in, in Warsaw, I found uh, a very uh, more quiet, more reflective uh, atmosphere of trying to get uh, to grips with why aren't things changing faster? Why are we not making progress uh, faster? Why do we get messages from IPCC, also from us, from the World Energy Council, that things aren't uh, you know, going as smooth as they should be in providing a sustainable system? Well, clearly the IPCC report has highlighted the scientific case. Um, you know, people are aware that we had the road to Copenhagen and uh, COP19 here in Warsaw uh, constitutes two years until Paris. Um, so, you know, one could be forgiven for, um, you know, sort of thinking that things aren't progressing quickly enough. Do you think we will meet the framework in time for 2015 in Paris? Um, we, in, in our latest work, the, the, the energy scenarios, we come to the conclusion that as far as, for example, the two degrees C target, we're not on track. We're heading at the moment uh, as best as we can see, four to five degrees C. Now, there's still a world of opportunity out there to bring us back on track. Uh, 2050 is, a, is, is, a, is a long way away. As far as the, the process and leading up to Paris, um, it's difficult for me to say, actually, as uh, you know, we're observers here. We're not part of the negotiation progress, so I, I'm actually uh, not best placed to answer that. I think uh, a lot depends on the on the external uh, environment as well. If we are, uh, if we have, uh, you know, relatively modest to good growth in economic terms in Europe. Uh, their attention can be focused on, you know, getting things together until Paris. If we suddenly are in, 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 in dire straits, uh, you know, attentions of politicians are quickly shifting to what needs to be done, and then we may not uh, be be able to, to meet that. But as I said, uh, I'm not the best placed person to to talk about process. Okay, uh, Professor. Rose. Um, obviously, the. You know, on the other side of the uh, the coin, you've got um, you know really what business can do to help. So, what what would your advice be at, at the World Energy Council? What would your advice be to business to you know obviously try and redress the balance to keep on track for the two degrees? I think uh, what uh, I've observed is uh, what I call the wall of silence. There's quite a number of business leaders who are concerned about that we can improve in certain areas of the whole climate and energy debate. And they tend to keep the, their voices sometimes to themselves. And that has to do with the fact that if you're a CEO of a, of a listed company, anything you say is, is share price sensitive. So, so you need to understand that business leaders cannot speak that freely uh, as, for example, we could do uh, in, in the World Energy Council. But I think the time has come that uh, they actually say certain things, uh, not only in private, but also in public, 
and to its politicians in, in order to say we need to make uh, faster progress. And actually it's not a question of uh, technologies. The technologies are there, we have the innovation, it's not a question that much of financing either. Yes, of course, overall there is still huge uh, questions around where money is going to come from. But it's uh, almost a, a question of establishing uh, a relationship of trust between policymakers and business or re-establishing it. It looks to me that, that in the whole energy and climate debate, these two parties have actually at some stage drifted apart and it's, um, it's, it's time to really get them close together again. Great. So, if, I mean, finally, what would you like to see happen in the next two years? I think, um, and I've said it uh, repeatedly here over the uh, last three days, I think uh, almost every country should really look at uh, uh, not only talk about energy and decide on what's the best uh, policy going forward, but also take, take a, a quiet moment, step back and think about its own national skills and competencies in the area of energy. And actually have action plans to improve that because I think uh, very often we just repeat phrases uh, in some of these discussions and uh, we have a very high complex system out there and in, in our scenarios we see complexity increasing even so it's not that easy to get a systemic overview of it and uh, people tend to then focus only on, on parts of the problem like supply side do we need to build more wind farms and photovoltaics Whilst you need to look at the system as such and, and also take into account the grid, the integration of the renewables, but also the consumer end and the prices and what can you afford. And this system thinking uh, can be improved. And for, for that to happen, people need to learn. And also decision makers need to learn. And because they're very senior people, both in business as well as in politics, they don't have the time. And, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's, we can actually go a long way further if we bring them up to a uh, level with uh, what experts think are the critical points and, and weak points and also strong points in the fields of energy and climate policy. So it's really meeting adaptation first and foremost to be able to mitigate. Is, is I, I think that uh, I would see mitigation and adaptation as parallel processes. I'll tell you why. I think mitigation is a, uh, is a huge driver for innovation which gives businesses opportunities and actually allows uh, policymakers to achieve goals of uh, emission uh, control. Whilst adaptation is the plan B, which is a risk management uh, activity which should run al uh, alongside so that governments can pre and countries can prepare themselves and saying, okay, we're doing what we can on mitigation and innovation to, to to, to keep uh, control of the situation, but we might not be 100% successful. So at the same time, we're looking at where do we need to invest as a, as a risk measure in terms of technology or, or, or provisions in the country uh, context in order to adapt to some potential fallouts if we're not uh, totally successful going forward.